So, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar on what's new at WorkSoft. We figured everybody's going back to school, and we did a lot of work over the summer, so we thought we should do a webinar, you know, back to school with WorkSoft and learn what's new. So, we'll cover three core areas, what's new in Capture, uh, what's new in Analyze, and what's new in Certified. So, all about how can we do discovery, actually do some analysis, and then build our um, automation itself. So remember, Capture is really focused on making the capturing of user interaction with the business process easy to use, right? Uh, we have the new Capture UI really focuses on the business users, allowing them for fast and accurate business process discovery. And then it can be launched as part of Analyze Standalone, or it can be launched from Certify. So remember, if you're in a Certify process, you do right-click, you know, use Capture, or if you're an Analyze user, you've got the standalone version. So Within Capture itself, we've got some new features we found where people were um, doing some capturing and they wanted to actually um, hide some data. Now, of course, um, passwords are automatically not captured. Um, you'll notice when you, you capture your password and you get to the certified automation, it's empty. Uh, but what we found is people wanted to pick specific fields and actually hide them and not show them in their gen docs or hide the data from their automation. And so we've added some enhancements there um, for the customers. So if I come over to Capture, um, I've got it running here. And as I walk through, I can start clicking through the user interface. Here I've got um, a SAP um, Fiori system. What you'll notice is I clicked. And on the right, um, the next step, or one step behind, I'm actually getting all the data. So I've completed that screen, so I'm going to pause. So you'll notice in my capture I have, it's very verbose, it has all the different information. It tells me what data was input into fields um, and what um, configurations I'm using. So you'll see here it says I entered 00, zero into the division field. Now, if I come over here and expand, I have some buttons here. One is remove data, one is remove image. So in some cases, you may want to um, remove sensitive data. So you want the documentation to say enter, but not the actual data you did. And that actually will follow through to the automation. You have an empty input field. Um, other times, maybe you want to hide um, the image so it doesn't show up in your gen doc or into your certified um, library. So it's an option. Um, not a lot of people use it, but think about if you're looking at um, to maybe taking some of your certified processes and you're documenting in an uh, environment, maybe um, user acceptance that has some sensitive data in it, or you're thinking about RPA processes. Um, obviously, Capture is doing a good job of capturing everything and some things you want to hide. Now, when you do the hide, what will happen is every time this field is in the Capture, it's for all of them. So every time I hit division, it, it will not, once I've said, please remove this data, if I capture it again and again, that data won't show up. So it's, it's at your capture session level, and it does remember when you've touched the same field over and over again. Um, so a huge advancement um, is live touch. Um, so a lot of people forget that capture supports um, live touch. So you can actually go through and from the capture interface do both capturing and live touching, which is kind of nice. Um, and the, some of you are using, say, older versions of Certify, so you're not on, say, Certify 11. Sure, if you're in a processing or editing, you would do a right-click, um, enter assess by live touch, or right-click, enter assess by, by capture. Now you can enjoy the, that experience for both of them. So it's really nice. It really helps um, make things much easier to um, work with. So, if I come over to um, the user interface and capture, so if I start my order, oops, now I forgot to record. So what I'll do is I'll click record, and this will start capturing, but maybe I need that one sole two-party field. If I go to live touch, you'll get the red highlight you're used to seeing. I'll click it and it adds a field in, right? I can come out of live text, so I can toggle out. I can keep working. Um, now, maybe I, um, I, I don't um, know my next field, 
So I maybe want to capture this empty, just like you normally would do. I live touch the sold to party, it grabs the data. If I actually pull um, in these other fields, it will highlight them and it will enter them without the data. So the same behavior, if you live touch an input field and there's data in it, you'll get the data. If you enter um, an empty live touch field, you get the fields there. And then you notice these created inputs. And then I'll go through, I'll add my material. And I'll put my quantity. And I'll click Save. And at the bottom, we have the standard order number. So when I live touch that, because it's an input, it's not an input field. When I highlight it, what we'll see is it will create the verify message step. So what you're used to seeing in, in, um, in capture of as you enter data, we get the screenshot from the data. But you can also just toggle immediately to live touch with the, with the fingerprint to touch. When you do input fields, if there's data in it, we'll create the input step with the data. If there's um, an output field or a label, we'll do a verify. So when I am, so if I actually learn how to use my mouse, there we go. So I look here on the verify step, we can see the screen image is there. And so then there's the text that was gathered. So I can see the step, the actual image, the window, and the object. All of the data you're used to seeing um, when you're doing, say, live touching. And then, of course, here when I did the save, I got my save button also. So the nice thing is I think this really helps um, streamline our workflow because we're going to have a We'll just have to go to capture, and we can do both activities, live touching and capturing. So I think it will overall help with efficiencies, and that way, um, you know, if you do clicks, you can always do a click in, um, since you've clicked on a field, but if you live touch it, it will automatically do the verify for you. So those are the type of things that most customers, um, when we talk to them, are very interested in. Okay. The last thing over here in capture is edit object. So edit object um, was added over the summer to capture itself. So one of the things that you're used to looking at um, is, say, on a web page, is like an edit object, and I can see how is the window and the object identified. Um, you can do it from capture. I mean, now you can do it from capture. You can do live touch or from your certified process. You can actually see if things that were highlighted. So we've added that functionality um, into capture also. So the idea is you're really going to have a great superset of capabilities um, in capture outside of certify. So everything, say a business person would need to record their actions, get the user interactions and create documentation, or an automation engineer to go look at that and see um, are my attributes right, and if they're not right, I can adjust them themselves. So if I come over here and see what I've done is enter data into say the, um, the input and the field date and the customer reference number. I'll go and open up that view again. Okay. So I have an edit object. Okay. So this is the screen we're used to seeing from certified perspective. It said, yes, I identified the window. Yes, I identified the object. And you can actually use the highlight. And we'll go through and we'll highlight the field for you. So everything you're used to, if I can actually go, say, retouch a live object and fix or heal an attribute, um, see the properties and attributes are all available. So we think we feel that this is really helping people rethink um, the way they're going to do their automation. In many cases, they're going to start with capture because it's um, it's lightweight, it's easy to do. But then when you're saying looking at a web application, you want to explore and maybe like see the attributes, make sure they're identifying. You've got um, all your functionality um, of your edit object available. So really pleased with all the things we've done this summer around capture itself and all the, um, the new fields here. So the idea is that we're going to get um, more and more features in capture. So over time, you'll see other things there. Okay.
Okay. Um, the last thing is the settings and the preferences. Um, there's been a couple new ones here, but um, just so that you remember that they're available, the idea is you have your capture save mode. So with your default action, you send it to analyze your save your XML to disk. Uh, on mine, it's set to um, collapse the named activity. So every time you hit a new named activity, the green steps roll up to the blue name. It does it automatically. You can globally disable data capture. So maybe you're capturing this data for someone because they need to discover processes for RPA. So they actually say capturing in production. So they want to not include all the data. So you can actually, from a flag perspective, say turn it off globally versus using the edit and actually doing it on a, a step and object level. Now, the image capture mode um, for both, I always use for both because it gives me a fresh screen of every time I interact with an object. We used to do optimize, so if you are using capture from a couple of years ago, it was optimized. Okay? And then on mine, I always leave the step in, in the information and thumbnails available because I like to look at that stuff, but a lot of times I understand um, when you've got your um, web optimization set for automatic, you don't want to see the um, which that it's using in um, 18 on Fiori, you know, stuff. That's fine. Now, remember the other things is you can reorder steps, you can um, rename named activities, when you add your common steps, you can move them around. Um, so what we'll see is there'll be more and more editing capabilities inside of Capture itself. Um, like for example, right now when you capture, the steps always go to the bottom. We're looking at should we let you say insert steps in the middle? So actually more proper editing will come. But we did a lot of work this summer around renaming and um, moving, moving steps around and comments and those things. So really, really happy with all the new things that have happened in Capture itself. So now we'll move to Analyze. So what we've really found is um, there's a bunch of new um, Analyze um, workflows. So the user workflows we've really um, iterated on this summer. Um, Analyze in our cloud hosted, we do a weekly update. And so those are made available to on-premise customers. And a lot of people on-premise kind of look at monthly upgrades because there's been so many new things there. So remember from the business perspective, um, when you build your captures, you've got all the documentation of the process, the screenshots, the data. We're finding business people are bringing those into um, Analyze because they want to get their high fidelity documentation. Sometimes we, the slang term is the gen doc. So when it loads up, they can get the PDF or the Word documents or both of the processes themselves. Um, that allows them to share them with their um, say documentation library. So if I've documented the new process or I've documented a change to the process, other people take the Word documents, they handshake them to the training classes, so they have fresh screenshots and the workflows within the product itself. Now what we have found is business people really want to start comparing different um, captures to see how the activities are different or similar. They're looking for like how common are these um, workflows, how similar are things working through the processes themselves. Okay. Um, and then uh, the other things we've done for the um, process automation team is we focus on exporting data and exporting automation and then actually finding data in duplicate tests. So when you have lots of people capturing, which is perfect, Sometimes the use case is new development discovery. Other times the use case is I have 100 manual tests. I want to capture those and convert them to automation as gracefully as possible. We've really focused on that workflow. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to go over is analyze repeated um, activities and steps. So when you log into um, Analyze itself, you get into the capture list. And what you can see is there's the concept of I've got repeated activities. And I've got repeated um, steps. And then we can actually start grouping them and looking at um, how they work itself. So I'm going to want to move out of SAP. I'm going to come over to analyze and log in. Let me clean up my screen. Oops. Full screen. So I haven't personally captured anything in the last 30 minutes, but if I click clear, what I'll do is it'll actually go show me all the captures in the system. So I can see for all the different users and for all time. 
And then what I'll do is I can actually start looking at the activities themselves. So I've got about 1,300 captures here. So I can see the different people who've been capturing. I can see their activity flows. I can see this was a sales order. Um, and this one had a login, the helper class, and a sales order. Um, maybe other people are doing some say, T codes and SAP, things like that. So I can see all the details. The nice thing is this allows me to actually go through and create my documentation and automation. Um, but I'm going to go over repeated past activities first. What this does is it actually goes through and says, how many people have done a capture that has the same activities? So in this case, VA1, we've got 184 people who've just captured a simple VA1. We've got 133 people who've actually captured um, a safe on a Fiori system, so they've gone from the home screen to the helper to the actual capture themselves. Okay. Um, if I drill into there, what I'll actually see is that these, um, these specific captures that are part of this. So I can see these are all the individual captures. I can get to the same menu to generate those. But what I'm probably interested in is how are these activities similar? So I can see they hit the home screen, they hit the helper, but when they created the sales order document, this is the number of times the different fields were entered. So if you think about the create sales order document, um, I did OR in you know, a 1710, 10, 0, 0, but some people entered um, sales office. So out of those captures, one person entered sales office. So it's probably an optional field and not a lot of people filled it out. Um, then there's the distribution channel um, as an autocomplete versus entering the data. Um, if I look down on the, the sales order overview, I can see there was um, sometimes people change the shift to parties, the four people, the terms of payment, so what this set me does is it shows me, okay, out of a sales order, how many fields are always being populated versus not? What is, what's the kind of distribution of the data that's being put into? What are the things people are interacting with? So from a very quick summary, I can see, okay, you know, these fields are probably the most commonly used. These are their errors or their um, corner cases in which people have interacted with them. So if I go back to my capture list, um, on this one here, what I'm going to do is um, export the data. So this is um, really helpful, to say the least. So what it did, it said these people um, who did the sales order, um, they did the same, say, primary screens or business activities, and they had different data. When I open the spreadsheet up, what I'm going to see is for each area, for the create sales document, this is the capture name, this is the data they entered, and there's the sales office has the certified skip character. So this data is automatically formatted for it to go into um, a certified process. The second folder tab is the other business activity, and what I can see here is I've got the, the same type of thing, the data, but I can see some people enter customer reference, some people enter different shift to parties, um, but maybe not everybody entered the same data. So in this term, we have the net terms entered here. If I scroll down, I can see different data, combinations of data. Okay, here's one where multiple people have entered the um, net terms and extra information. So if I'm interested in that to see, okay, what was the, um, the capture associated with that? So this row here is kind of interesting. They've entered different data. What did that look like? Well. The easiest thing to do is I can click and we build a reference back into here. I can actually see all the details and the data that was entered. So here's the data, here's the individual fields in tabular format. I can actually see the comments and that there was verify steps. And I can actually go create my documentation. So that's the one that I want to use because it had the most data, it had a net terms, and so I'm going to call this net terms. It's in the name of my document, and I'll create my gen doc there. So it helps me actually figure out what's going on. So I can actually link back and forth by looking at the detailed data in Excel and what's in the user interface. Okay. So if I come back to my um, core view here, activities is basically looking at, did the people do the same business activity? How similar are they to the extra business steps or um, different business steps? When I do a repeated path by step, 
This one actually looks at them in a very different view. It says ignore the comments, ignore the names, ignore the verification steps, and just look at the input steps. Like how similar were these things? Okay. So in this VA01, we had 22 people who actually entered the same 10 steps. Okay. And this one here, uh, this in Sapgui, from the order to the delivery, we had 14 steps entered and 20 people did the same thing. This one on the web. So what this means is we're ending up with basically a data-driven test. There's, there were 14 steps entered in the UI and people did the exact same thing, right? These are, these are the ones that David Kelly did. Here are the steps. Now, when we give you the table here, we're showing you a little bit different data. We're actually looking for unique values, okay? So if we had 20 people capture this, and then, so the order number, there was 20 um, unique order numbers. There was 18 unique dates, but there's only one shipping point used, one sold to party used, one ship to party used. So what I can see is, hey, part of this test data, they're always entering the same sold to and ship to parties, but they're varying their orders, their, maybe their dates on the orders and that. We're showing you how different or similar the data is. So ideally, if you've maybe got a lot of manual tests out there and you want to start converting into automation, when they do their manual tests, if they do captures, we would say, okay, these are actually doing the exact same things. This is a no-brainer. It's a data-driven test. We can tell you the distribution of the data. Looks like a lot of this data isn't variableized. It's not dynamic or changing. It's actually very much the same. So it may change the way we think about building the automation itself. Okay. Um, so if I come back over here, um, say look at this, this one here, this is based on a Fiori system. Look at the steps. I can see the same type thing, the variation of data, lots of different customer references, two different um, sold to and shifty parties you use in the system, but one channel and, and document type. So when we look at the, um, come back to the bigger picture, on the initial values, what we can say is these are the captures I've been put to the system. I can generate documentation, I can export data, I can um, create automation, but when it starts to do the analysis, the repeated pass by activities means that they've done the same activities, over and over again. And on this one, we're saying they actually entered the same data. So the user interaction with the user interface was exactly the same. So these are the two um, things we found first were super helpful when you start looking at how similar my processes, or some people call it the harmonization phase, when you're doing an s hana how similar are things. So we'll show you whether they're similar in activities or similar in the steps themselves. So both of these things um, we found have been super helpful in the fact that you can create the documentation, um, the automation, and the data consistently across all of them. Next thing I want to go over is the new collections. So um, initially we said, hey, people want to find what they did in the last 30 minutes. They're looking for things that they, things they put in. Um, and then what we found is people want to start building collections or groups of um, captures that work together. Um, so it's a logical grouping um, that where you can, different people who've done different captures at different points in time can group them together. Um, it could be something like in your Agile, you're grouping all the um, captures for an epic or for a feature, or maybe you've got multiple captures for a story, or looking at a user journey across a business process for end to end. I want to put all my, um, order to deliveries, or my order to fulfillment, to delivery, to um, accounts payable, receivable processes. You, know, you can group, put them any way you want. Um, the, you can get your captures from the listing. You can actually specify during import where the capture should go. Um, and then we can actually still do the groups on um, repeated activities from there. So the nice thing is it really helps us focus on um, finding um, like organizing our um, captures to do better documentation and automation. So if I come here, I can see I've got collections. So these are collections that exist, right? So I've got one for sales order bikes, um, I've got one that shows me some staff GUIs, one's for some sales force opportunities. Okay. So I can actually select individual and I can say add to collection um, or I can create a collection 
and I've now added those into there. Um, the other thing I do is if I do an upload, you'll notice I have the collection as defaulted here. So if I do any uploads of my XMLs and my captures, they'll throw in that collection itself. So you, once you get the captures in to analyze, you have the ability to start building your collections out. So if I look at my um, sales orders by buying, I can see these have happened by different people. So different people have captured them, different people have uploaded them, and then I can um, um, do all the type of things I've done before. So I can actually say, show me them that have similar activities. Okay. So what were my most common workflows? You know, with, whether it was um, from the SAP GUI or say from the um, Fiori UIs. Um, but it allows me to basically work with a subset of these. So if I'm just specifically maybe looking at orders for my drive goods, or order goods for my frozen food chain, things like that, I can group them together. I still have access to my repeated paths here. So um, nice thing we've added is basically lets you um, think about how you're going to organize things so that multiple teams working together. Um, now the last thing I want to go over is like actually what does it look like to start doing some um, deep diving into finding similar captures and what do they look like. Um, so when you're looking at a collection, you can say show me the specific, um, how they're grouped by activity or grouped by steps. But remember there's also an um, ability to do searches into them. So looking for different um, types of data and then, uh, or different business activities and then we'll like segment them down. Of course, from there, you sell the same common workflows of creating um, business processes. So if I come over into my collections, I'm gonna to go to my bike orders. If I type um, BDL01N, well, what happens is a subset and say, only show me the captures that have a delivery inside of them, okay? So you can actually search for that. So maybe I don't want things that are just, that are just captured but don't have an in process. Um, maybe it's like, show me VF1, okay? I'm just interested in ones that actually go all of the, that have deliveries. So I can search for um, different um, keywords in the activity to subset these. Now, of course, the repeated paths, both of those actually have the same activity path. So I can actually go look at them and drill in and say for the people who did um, an order and took it all the way to delivering billing, I can see the information in the fields they entered with it. I can actually see the specific captures and I can go back. So the idea is we're going to start building out lots of things here, but there's a lot of good information here. So like I said before, you can group on activities and by paths if you've got these things and you want to start searching on only specific um, things. Maybe I only want ones that have Fiori in the name. So I'm only capturing um, things that have Fiori, and these are the similar activities, so I'm basically not capturing ones that have uh, SAP GUI in them. So um, it seems simple, but obviously it's super powerful to say, show me um, activities by looking for names. You can also do them by person, um, and you can actually toggle on, show me just the ones I've captured. So I didn't have any with Fiori. I have other ones that don't have Fiori. So the same type of filtering is available. Remember, you can hide it. But we're basically finding this is an easy way to start grouping and finding out, okay, what do I have? What do my processes look like? And then how do I start documenting, figuring out repeatable processes, and what do I want to start automating? Now I'm going to move over to certify. So um, I think at the beginning of the call, at least 33% of the people have been using Certified for two years, another third from about you know, one to two years. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being customers. And as you know, um, Certify is our flagship product for um, process automation. And so we've um, finished up some new things um, from an epic perspective of our process versioning and our change management. How do we do process compares and merges? So this YouTube's out where we've done process compare, merge, and import and export. The last thing we did to kind of finish up the epic on change management is versioning. So I'll show you what the specific versioning looks like. And remember, um, we're really focusing on some of the features that people are doing every day, things that um, test authors want to do, um, and then we're expanding some of the runtime options um, that we'll see in a bit. 
So for versioning, um, what versioning does is lets you make a copy of a process and it stores it into the certified database. So basically, we take the steps in the editor. So um, execution steps are just another step that call a sub-process. Um, it doesn't worry about the dependencies and all that that's gathered with the process export. Remember, process exporting means process, the child processes, the children of the children's processes, the data, all of the record sets, all of the app, um, attributes, of the objects and all that, we gather everything. Versioning is simply just the edit, what I'm working with in the editor. I want to make it a version of this so I can compare it. And um, most importantly, I can undelete it, right? So I'm going to close out of here. I'm going to come over to certify. So here I have a process I imported. Okay, so I can see the simple order process has a bunch of execute steps and calls other children. Um, if I look at the sales order overview, this has a lot of steps in it. So I come to this version tab. What I can see, I have two versions. I have this initial version that has the capture data that I created. Here's one uh, that, I, that was created after I did um, created the um, layout. So if I want to create another version, I can say create version. I can put a note there. And what will happen is I now have a, basically a backup copy, a snapshot, or a version of this process. Now, the current version, as we saw here, has variables in it. But this first version here actually doesn't. So if I do a right click, and I can say compare um, version to current, what we can see here is in, the, in that first version one that we took, and I did it basically right after my import, it has all the hard-coded data, and those have turned into variables. So I can actually see how does this process compare to the previous one. Okay? Um, and if I wanted to um, say roll back, um, I could do that. So the other thing you can do is you can compare two versions. So I can actually compare two versions to themselves and compare these two versions versus the one in the editor. I can see the differences. Okay. So now I just took a snapshot here called Work Today. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to edit this. And sometimes you just have a bad day, right? And you're like, don't need that, save, oh, oop, uh, well, um, close that. Actually, I kind of needed that. I, I, I needed those steps. Well, what do you do? Well, you, you cry. Um, or I just I took a version. I did some edits. Actually, I'm not happy with those edits. I'm going to say, let's restore this process. So I'm going to overlay the existing one with the one that exists. And now I brought it back to the snapshot this morning. My steps are back. Okay, so um, a lot of people think of versioning as um, very um, like workflow driven. I just need a snapshot. I want to compare differences. But in reality, when you think about change management, if this is in production, you say your gold copy folder or, or, or gold project, you pull it backwards, and you want to see the, the changes someone did to edit it. Maybe they said I variableized these things, and you want to verify that have them take a snapshot before they edit, and then compare it to the existing one. So it'll help with kind of those change management workflows. Okay. Another thing that happens quite often is people delete an entire process. Wah, wah, wah. So you're like, oh, I needed that one. So um, what we've done is we will automatically version processes as they get deleted. So when I come over here, I can see change history under tools. Okay. I can see that there was a version of this process taken, and Chris deleted this process. So first, shame on you, Chris. Don't delete processes you need. But you can actually do a restore. Now, this is done automatically if you're in the later versions of Certify. Now, it'll let me pick the folder to put it back into. So maybe you want to restore it into a different folder, or it'll default to back where it was. I'll say select, I'll let it open. So now, What's happened is that process has been restored. So even though I deleted it, oops, my bad, I can see it's not here on the bottom of the page. So we've actually restored it. So the versioning is ultra helpful. Um, I always was a practice when I import, say, a new capture or automation from Analyze, I take a version so I have the original data 
Then I start working through my variabilization, um, um, adding variables, changing dates and times. Maybe I create some sub-processes. Um, and then I can always go back and look at it. Or sometimes I think I'm into doing lots of editing. I might want to take a quick backup. Um, if I'm worried I might mess up my edits, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the biggest thing is I can actually restore a deleted process. Um, uh, word in the field is people love that. Okay. Um, another big thing we've done in Certify is actually record set to layout mapping. So normally you think about I'm going to import a CSV or an Excel file, and you organize them so they matched the um, layout. But um, we've actually put a new editor there. So if I come over into um, Certify and if I look at my data, over here in my sandbox, I have a layout, right? And it's got a couple record sets in it. Now, if I want to put data into here, we've now added a new editor. So this editor allows me to pick my CSV or my Excel spreadsheet, and I can actually map what's in my Excel spreadsheet into um, the columns themselves. So I can have the sales order right. So what I exported earlier. Remember I said, in that case, we had um, multiple sheets. So I, I can say I'm actually interested in the um, standard order overview sheet. So this is the data from that sheet. Like here's the capture name itself. Um, but here's a sole two party. Now, these names are by position. Mm, that doesn't look right. I don't want the sole two party to be simple order and the, the customer reference to be C1000. So it, it read it in, in position. I'll say map by name. It says, okay, if the column name matches the variable, line them up, the material and row. So I happen to know my material and my row were actually, you know, um, different columns is how we saw them from the capture perspective. So I'm just going to say, give me that data. Here, give me the row data. So now I can see, okay, this is awesome. I, here are my variables and my layout. I've now mapped data from either the Excel or the um, comma separated list into there, and I can say overwrite or append. If I say append, I'll add the new rows into my record set, so I've got my new data. Okay. So super cool, hope you love it. I am thrilled that I can do that. It makes life so much easier than when I'm doing those things itself. Okay. Um, so those are kind of the big spots in editing. Um, if you look on the YouTube channel, there's other enhancements to certify, but I thought I'd focus on those. Um, and then I want to go over some of the new runtime things. So um, as you know, we put the, um, the fail threshold um, into certifying um, end of last year. So you can say stop on fail, or actually stop after the third fail, or the fifth fail, or the tenth fail. You know, because sometimes you want to have multiple validations occur before you stop running and say give up. Um, we've also added um, a new thing down here called um, screen history. So what I found is in lower environments, say not in the UAT, um, people were capturing all their screens just because they wanted to, they needed to see the context of how did they get to an error, um, um, what was the leading up steps of the error, um, and we said okay, and then they complained I'm filling my database with screenshots. So this will let you actually set a buffer. It says for every failure, capture the screen that failed and the previous three screens. So you can see in, in the um, results how you got to that failure, okay? Um, and so in this case, if I had two failures, I would end up with um, six um, screen histories, three before the first error and then three before the second error, okay? Um, so it, it prevents the need to capture every screen. Now, Obviously, if your BPP report is only showing failed steps, you'll get the screenshots you need. Um, if your BPP is, say, for your user acceptance environment and you're doing your final um, sign-off documents, you're going to capture all your screens for all your past steps and that. So it doesn't change that workflow. But what it does is it really does help you um, make it easier when it comes to debugging. Okay, is my error because I missed the, there was a validation check on the previous fail, page that failed? or the application is misbehaving on the previous page or the previous step, things like that. The other thing I want to go over was preview features. So under the um, tools and the interfaces, you've got the certified web options. We've always had the user settings and the global settings. There's a new area here called preview. And this is where 
as things go, um, code complete, and we're, um, we're past beta, but we want customers to start looking at things and trying them and give them feedback. Instead of asking them to install a whole new version of Certify, we've started the concept of preview features. So you can basically turn on and off new functionality and Certify here. So like the auto detect of your definition configurations for web optimization, I will turn on. Um, this is performance improvements for Internet Explorer, you can turn on. Um, we initially had Chrome here. So if you, uh, last summer, um, so over a year ago, we introduced um, optimizations and performance improvements for Chrome. We put them in as an opt-in. You, you click the check and it moves processing to different spots to make it faster. And we found there's a dramatic speed increase in the, in the actual test running. Well, we've added that same thing to IE. So now you can opt in and say, I want, you know, I want to see what happens when I get the performance optimizations for browser testing with IE. Check, when you click that check, we'll actually do the, the necessary stuff in the background and you'll notice there'll be a huge performance increase in certified process. Now, that may mean that you need to think about setting your object timeouts, you know, changes a little bit, or remove all those silly wait steps that you have that you don't need. Um, and the last one, the verify mouse click. So we've always been really good at detecting the user did a click, um, did it actually get into the system and or test, into the application, or maybe do you have a pop-up on Tuesday nights of um, the, the IE is going to, or the machine is going to reboot, or you've got patch Wednesdays and you're going to get a, a Windows patch, so it's stealing focus. Well, the verify mouse clicks and actions in the browser mean that we'll detect did the click actually go to the browser or did something hijack the focus on the desktop itself. So there'll be huge helps with stability, and that's something you can actually opt into with the checkbox there. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to cover with Certify was actually um, the net UI. So many people are familiar with Silverlight. They've used Silverlight for years. Um, there's actually a new um, new live touch interface you can see called, called NetUI. And it's specifically designed to help you with live touching Windows Forms and WPF. Okay? So not VB apps, not Java, not other things you do with Silverlight. It's specific to those two technologies. Um, it is XML extensible. So the nice thing is, um, when you click through, in this case, I actually clicked in Certify. So you can see I did clicks on the toolbar. I did a click on the process editor tree. I did a, a click into the processes, and I got a, um, a find row. So um, the challenge with Windows and WPF is there's lots of different controls that look like tables and tab controls and trees and such. Um, so we said we've gotten really good at describing those with the web optimizations, so we want to do the same thing for these Windows applications. So you don't have to get a new DLL, you can actually have a description, um, an XML description that tells us, oh, by the way, that third party control is actually a table, or it's actually a tree, and this is how you interact with it. So NetUI um, was GA this summer, so when you upgrade to your certifies, you'll notice it's there, you'll notice it in live touch. Um, so I encourage you to start using it with your Windows Forms and WPF, and if you end up with a control you can't see, just let support know, and they'll um, help you walk through creating the, um, the definition, so we actually identify those objects themselves. Okay. So at this point, I've kind of rushed through a ton of information in the last 50 minutes, um, so I'll open it for question and answers. Uh, yeah, and we, we do have a few questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, some of these may be a little more detailed than we can get into in the time that we have left. But um, one question is, will the version uh, be kept if you restore a detailed process? Yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah, so, we, so, the, um, so whatever version you pick is the one that gets restored. If, you have, if you've kept five versions of it um, and you, you restore the, the third version or the fourth version, that's the one that goes back. And so you can pick the version. It doesn't have to be the latest. Um, okay, and someone has asked, um, how do I transfer scripts from one workshop instance to another? I use process export. Um, that's the easiest way to do it. When you're an automator tonight, you'll notice if you do a right click and you do export, what we'll do is we'll take the process, all the sub-processes, all the attributes for the applications, the record sets and the data, and we'll put them into a zip file with a manifest. You can import them into your same project into a different folder. You can put them into a new project, or maybe you put them into a different database. 
Um, there's a YouTube video under the uh, Certify 11 that, ex that shows you um, a, de a description and, and a, um, a how-to, the differences between process export and process versioning. At the end of the deck, there's some links if you don't know how to get to our YouTube channel. But there's a great YouTube that actually answers that question in detail for you. Great. And our follow-up email will share a copy of this recording as well as uh, links to those channels that we're referring to. Um, we have a question. Someone says, I have uh, a few Fiori scripts using a framework I've created in another tool. Can we use the migration process for migrating them to WorkSoft scripts? So um, it depends. If it's SAP GUI, it's pretty easy to do. Um, if it's uh, for Fiori, um, we'll have to look at it. So it depends on the tool that you're using. Um, for SAP GUI, we have a way to, to, um, to transfer those, like the UFT replacement program. If it's Fiori, um, you know, contact your pre-sales guys and we'll look at it. Okay. Um, and we have a question, is physical naming slash edit possible to change only for web? Um, no, you can actually, so the name of like the window or the, the button, normally edit object is from, say, from um, capture, um, is only edit, you only get edit object from capture on web apps and say, um, say like a Java app. But if it's like SAP GUI, obviously edit object doesn't exist. But you can go over and you can always rename them. So when you, if you go to the application version, the windows, and you do a right click edit, you can rename them there. Um, there's, there's the logical name, which is like, this is my checkbox or, you know, sold to party, ship to party. And then inside of it is the attribute string. The attribute string is the magic of how we identify it. So if you wanted to change sold to party to sold to dash party, you could do that. Yes, those can be edited. It's the attribute string that's the magic connection. Okay. And another question um, one of our attendees would like to know from which certified version all these features are supported. Okay. So this is the 1908 version. So um, we so we've moved to um, naming the monthly releases, um, 19 for 2019, and then the months so 05 May, 06 June, um, 09 will be coming out next. So this is the GA of 1809. So everything I showed you today is actually GA in the product. It's all the cool stuff we did this summer, getting ready to go back to school. Okay, and one more. If a process has a version and the process itself gets deleted, Will the version also get deleted along with it? So the version, when you delete a process, the version history goes away, but you can restore the process, um, the deleted process. So we, we weren't carrying all the extra versions with it. Um, it's something we can do. Um, if, you, if that's something you feel strongly we need to do, uh, go to the customer community in the ideas forum and um, enter it and get your friends to vote it up. That when we say automatically save a copy of a process on delete, save all the previous versions of it too. So currently it doesn't, but that's something we can do. Um, it's totally based on you guys getting together and voting those ideas up. Okay, great. And um, we, we do have more questions than we have time to get to. So those of you who ask questions that we didn't have a, an opportunity to um, dive into here on the conversation, we'll, we'll get an email follow-up so we can get those answered for you. Um, we definitely have uh, some resources listed for you here on your screen. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we have our YouTube channel where you can um, get copies of uh, past webinars, and product videos, um, all, all things WorkSoft you can find, yep. find here. Yeah, people always ask, where do I get the replay? It'll be put out on YouTube. So there's a link to it that you can get to it from uh, the WorkSoft webinar um, playlist on the YouTube channel. Yeah, got it right. <laughs> yeah, and all of our registrants will receive an email um, probably early next week with a direct link uh, to today's recording. And if you're going to be at SAP TechEd in Vegas next week, we encourage you to stop by our booth, um, number 525, and see us there. We are um, giving away um, an Xbox One X video game console, so stop by um, and visit our booth. Thank you everyone, thanks for your participation today.